The Lord is my shepherd, still waters, overflowing cup, goodness and mercy. This psalm aces every test for the best loved and most familiar. It's the one that makes it into the little leaflets you get at funeral homes. When our oldest daughter was about two, she started naming things from bits of conversation she overheard. She had a very large rocking horse that was named Charlie Horse. And then there were the two dolls, Shirley Goodness and her sister Mercy. Everybody knows this psalm. And I've been vaguely aware for most of my life that I don't resonate with it the way most people do. But I didn't really analyze it until I had been through that valley. The thing I don't like about this psalm is the storyline. It starts out about what God does for me, leads me through green pastures to still waters. So there I am, walking in God's right paths for his name's sake. And where do I immediately end up? When I'm not looking, I have ended up in the darkest valley. <laughs> Right, so I get through the valley and what's waiting for me? My enemies watching my every move. But never fear when I'm dead and gone, my enemies have succeeded in killing me perhaps, I'll live in God's house. Now personally, I don't think I need God's help getting into trouble. I can do that very competently by myself, thank you very much. I want God's help to getting out of trouble. I find comfort is God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And Psalm 40, which begins, I waited patiently for the Lord. God inclined his ear to me and heard my cry. The Lord drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. God put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And having come through that valley, instead of the table in the presence of my enemies, I want some of those vine and fig tree years promised by the prophet Micah, where we will live in peace and unafraid, enjoying our gardens. I want my salvation here and now, not in the sweet by and by. But, on the other hand, with that said, in 2002, John and I accepted a call to Country Homes Christian Church in Spokane. Our leaving Beaverton was hard and fast. Our house sold at the Realtor's Open House. It was on the market something like four hours and we got the full price offer. Our duplex sold in several days. We were packing and flying back and forth to Spokane looking at homes and John was winding up his ministry. And somewhere in that chaos, I realized something was wrong. The second day we were in our house in Spokane, I called the advice nurse for Group Health, our new health care provider. She told me it was a cyst. My mammogram just six months ago was clear. But she was wrong. I was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer, one of the kinds most likely to kill you very quickly. I know now that the five-year survival rate for IBC was 17%, but mine was triple negative, which means there was no hormone that the cancer liked to attach the chemo to for more effective targeting. That took me up to about a 10% possibility of even being alive in 2007. I had not unpacked. We had no friends or family in Spokane. We both had new jobs, and the house we bought needed major renovations just to be functional. We seem to buy houses with, dis with kitchens that don't work. I don't know. <laughs> so um, we had planned to make it livable, to make money when we sold it so we could buy our home here. Our daughters were both getting married in a couple months, and there we were up against nine or more grueling months and the aftermath of aggressive chemo, aggressive surgery, followed by aggressive radiation. At that point, it was not God is a very present help in time of trouble. 
or, O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh God, make haste to help me, that I turn to. It was the line from the 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. That became my sustaining scripture. My surgeon could not hide the fact that she thought I was going to die. My oncologist told me that some women with inflammatory breast cancer survive, and there was no reason I couldn't be one of them. Sandra Cordham told me there was some very good information online about inflammatory breast cancer, but don't look at the survival rates. Besides, they're at least five years out of date. Don't look at them, and I didn't. <laughs> I had just stepped off that cliff and was in free fall, hoping that that valley had a bottom. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not. I will. Will is something I can control, decide. I could not decide not to be in that valley but I could decide not to be afraid, and I did. After I was no longer afraid, I could make some important decisions. The next one was that I was going to make an all-out appeal for prayer support. Somewhere when I wasn't looking, I had turned into one of those middle-aged women who ran the Oregon region. I was very well known from leadership in regional assemblies, clergy retreats, and various regional events. I recruited prayer support by email. A number of people I emailed hit the forward button, and I got some wonderful responses from people I had never met. Our soon-to-be son-in-law, Glenn, put me on the worldwide Episcopal monks prayer list, and his family, Mennonite farmers in Kansas, asked people to pray for me. I have no idea how far and wide my appeals went. While I was going through chemo treatment, I emailed a bajillion people about every two weeks. I realized that if I wanted to keep people's prayer attention, I needed to give them something interesting. So I wrote about my journey through the valley and what I was learning. And later, I figured out that by writing about what was going on while it was happening, I had dealt with my cancer issues as they came. A dear friend, Lori Strait, hesitated to tell me about her cancer diagnosis. She was worried that it would give me flashbacks. I told her, I'm exhibit A. It can be done. So far, the only emotional flashback was when someone had trouble sticking me a needle in me for blood getting the needle in and yelling for help. <laughs> Not having lingering issues is an unexpected blessing. In continuing my thinking about what decisions I could make, I realized that sometimes our range of decision making is much smaller than we'd like. And I suspect that gets more and more true as we get older. I could not decide to go through the valley, but I could decide how I was going to go through it. <coughs> so I was not going to be afraid. I was going to have as much prayer support as I could rally. And I decided I was going to do this with as much grace and style as I could manage. That came to mean several things. First, I would be considerate and graceful toward all the medical people I encountered. I was, and I got very good payback on that one. I dealt with every major medical facility and a number of the smaller ones in Spokane. And I didn't work with anybody who was not very competent, pleasant, and helpful, with the exception of someone doing valet parking at Sacred Heart Hospital. <laughs> the medical community in Spokane has been very good to me. And I have smiled and said thank you to nurses who woke me up in the middle of the night to take my blood. When I lost all my hair, and I don't just mean the hair on my head, I decided I would not go out without drawing a face on, eyebrows and some eyeliner so I would have a face. And I would put something interesting, if not attractive, on my head. <laughs> then I moved to another word, through. I was not just going into the valley, I was going through it. And that meant coming out on the other side. This gave me an emotional light 
at the end of the tunnel. Some days I did not get very far, but I was moving towards something, not just wandering around. And then I thought about the shepherd leading me through that valley. I realized that going through the valley was not just a me and Jesus experience. I needed and had Jesus in bodily form. As Paul teaches, the church is the body of Christ. Many people went with me through the path through that valley. Many people helped me over the rocky and slippery places and kept me be from becoming discouraged. They brought food and they prayed for my healing faithfully. Those people were continuing Jesus' ministry of healing. And I came to understand that a shepherd leads a flock, not an individual sheep. Paul told the Galatians, bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Being part of God's flock means taking responsibility for caring for the other sheep when they need it. People who have just one sheep are 4-H kids, not shepherds. <laughs> I believe the popular just me and Jesus thinking totally misses the biblical teaching on what it means to be the body of Christ. I don't believe the song, you must walk this lonesome valley, you have to walk it by yourself. The good news is that we don't have to go through those valleys alone. I don't believe the praise song, where do I go when I need a friend, down on my knees again. When I need a friend, I don't go down on my knees, I go to the body of Christ. The good news is that we are not the single lamb of a 4-H kid. We are part of God's flock, and the other sheep are there for us. This is good news, and this is part of my salvation in the here and now. I plan to sit under my vine, and well, next to my vine, and watching my fig tree grow. I'm having my vine and fig tree years. My fig tree was a gift from a friend who had went through that valley before I did. She, she read what I wrote about vine and fig tree years and brought me a little fig tree from her yard. It's now about this tall and it's very happy to be out of the pot now that we're here. <laughs> I have come through that valley with a much deeper appreciation of the church as the body of Christ doing Jesus' ministry. I have come through that valley believing I can assist people in that valley in ways that can only be learned by experience. And I have come out of that valley believing that prayer has amazing healing powers we do not understand. So with Paul, I urge you to encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and be thankful. Amen.